We've seen so much interest in our special 23% off offer for our e-course, Discover Your Second Act Significance, that we're continuing it throughout February. The three-module video course will equip you to transform your life from, is this all there is, to this is all I've ever wanted. Each session is led by Beyond the Crucible founder Warwick Fairfax, who shares his own hard-won successes in turning trials into triumphs. And he's got some high-powered help from USA Today's gratitude guru to a runner-up on TV's Project Runway, from a recording artist with a Billboard number one album to a couple of best-selling authors. It's an ensemble of men and women living significant second acts who would command a six-figure price tag if any business wanted to fill an auditorium with them to coach their employees. But we've packed their insights and action steps into our course for a sliver of that cost. And if you act before the end of February, you'll get 23% off your enrollment. Just visit secondactsignificance.com and use the code 23 for 23. So don't delay. Enroll today and remember, life's too short to live a life you don't love. Now, here's today's podcast episode. So welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast on which we discuss some of life's most devastating, challenging events and circumstances. We call them crucible experiences, and we talk about them to offer hope and healing that as painful as they may be, they are not the end of your story. In fact, they can be the beginning of a new chapter of your story filled with purpose and, yes, with joy. And speaking of new chapters, you've joined us as we are in the midst of our special series, Burn the Ships. So for the next several weeks, we will be talking with guests who have been brave enough to make dramatic pivots, leaving behind safe and familiar lives to do something dramatic, new, life-changing, and significant, facing down and overcoming crucibles along the way. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our host and guide is Warwick Fairfax, founder of Beyond the Crucible, who has himself set a few figurative ships on fire in pursuit of his vision for a life of significance, which gives him both insights into and compassion for others who have walked a similar path. Warwick, uh, we have another remarkable guest today uh, with much to share uh, and encourage us and encourage our listeners with, don't we? Absolutely, Gary. Really looking forward to it. It should be great. And our guest today, listener, is Erin Eddy. And I'm going to read her bio, but I'm going to read it in the first person because that's how Erin wrote it. And I think by the time you've listened to, I was going to say the end of this episode, by the time you've listened to a few minutes of this episode, you will understand um, why Erin's bio is written in the first person because Erin is not um, afraid of the first person and uh, much that she has to teach us comes from the first person. So Raised by two furniture makers on a lot of land in the North Georgia mountains, I've been learning to lead so worth loving for the last decade. I've seen individuals overcome depression, anxiety, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and eating disorders by seeking healthy, safe people to confide in and find resources out there to help find light in the middle of darkness. While I wouldn't consider myself an expert on anything, really, in my 12-year journey of observing, learning, and growing in the mission of storytelling, I have developed an understanding that when people are honest and vulnerable in their own stories, it compels others to respond likewise. So Worth Loving is a bridge to this conversation and all conversations that scare us. Warwick, that's a, uh, a pretty good setup for you to begin our question, and I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. And Aaron, thank you so much for being here. I loved reading your book, So Worth Loving. I mean, obviously, we grew up very differently. You, you know, small town in Georgia, me, big city, Sydney in Australia, and, you know, <laughs> uh, massive family business, but just this whole concept of, uh, which we'll get into a bit, your journey to um, both help other people realize that they're loved, but also realize that 
you're loved, which is almost feels like a lifelong journey to actually realize that obviously for you and I that the God uh, loves us and loves everybody unconditionally. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I love the theme of your book and I resonated with so much of it despite our backgrounds being pretty radically different, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> so, but before we get into, and obviously we want to hear a bit about So Worth Loving in terms of your whole um, company and how that all got started, but tell us a bit of the backstory about, you know, growing up in a small town in, uh, in Georgia with parents who are entrepreneurial uh, furniture, you know, uh, <laughs> folks with a store and uh, sounds like a fat and you know a couple of sisters and so just tell us a bit about yeah. uh, what life was like for you growing up. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored, and I uh, I love that our stories can be so different, and yet we can connect on so many levels of the emotional ups and downs that come with owning something um, to struggling with owning something, whether it's owning our emotions or it's owning a business. Mm. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I, um, my parents, they've manufactured furniture for almost 40 years. And my grandmother actually, she was the, uh, she was the person that owned her business before my mom and dad decided to go on that endeavor. And her business, she was the fastest growing furniture maker in the South. It was so rare for women business owners to emerge in the seventies and eighties. And so they were fascinated and Ronald Reagan, like he, he <laughs> honored her at the white house. And, uh, cause it was like, oh, wow. who is this female that owns a business in the South, you know, and it's successful. <laughs> um, and, uh, he really empowered women in that way. And so anyway, so I did grow up with that in my blood, like entrepreneurship was in my, my DNA from my grandma to my grandfather, to my great grandma, my great grandfather just kind of I'm a lineage of it, but I uh, grew up tiny town, three thousand people, so a little smaller than at the town that you grew up in. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so it's smaller than uh, Sydney, just a tad, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, my my uh, family, we had tons of animals. I mean, we bred Great Danes, we bred Jack Russells. It was like a zoo on sixteen acres <laughs> in this tiny town. But what's interesting and, and, and unique about my story is that while I grew up in the South, both my parents are from the North. So my dad's from Ohio and my mom's from Indiana. So I didn't have this typical Southern bell that you hear like small town in the South. I, while I was in a small town in the South, I was raised by uh, people from the Midwest and up North. So Bravo. Uh, I just, as someone who lives in Wisconsin and was born in Wisconsin, <laughs> I have to applaud that. So, well, and, and I say, you know, uh, my wife actually came from a small town in Northeast Ohio. So pretty familiar oh, with Ohio. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice. See, so I, I grew up with, you know, my mom loved Miracle Whip, not mayonnaise. I don't know if that's a Midwest, <laughs> Northern thing, but that's like, all of our sandwiches were very sweet. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, I grew up really like my dad. So I'm one of three girls. I'm the last born. And my dad just always empowered the women in the house. And that goes to, he was raised by a single mom, which was my grandma who was the furniture maker mm. and owner. And so female, uh, empowerment was just a thing. It was just empowering our voice in general, mm. not, not because we're female, but just because we're a person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that just kind of bred this within me that I can believe parts of myself that I'm capable. I am capable of doing things and pursuing and dreaming. And, and so I went to an all girl school. So, I mean, I was, I know a lot about women. <laughs> I grew up, <laughs> grew up all girls. I went to an all girl school, the boarding school. I was a day student and uh, just was not really good at academics. Like I learned pretty quickly in fifth grade, I was pretty bad at it. And I'd rather be dreaming and creating with my hands Mm. and with, and writing. I mean, I was a journaler since I was 12. So I have over a hundred journals now, um, to writing poetry and feelings and thoughts and observations is always something that I did. And that's the, the other thing that my dad bred was just be honest with your thoughts, be honest with your thought life. And my mom, my mom also was an example of that. So I grew up with some incredible parents that, just empowered us to come into our own. Uh, but even then I was confused on what it was mm. that I wanted to do because I didn't go to college. I wasn't really sure. 
I knew I had dreams, but I didn't know if any of them were tangible. And after I graduated high school, I left the family business. So it was kind of like all of us girls grew up at showrooms, furniture showrooms in High Point, North Carolina. And like right. we, we were we were setting up all, I mean, we traveled with my dad uh, in his box truck and we smelled like furniture blankets most of the time and saw that. <laughs> <So like, laughs> we, we all, we all end dust furniture and knew that like what types of products to use at too young of an age. Like, <laughs> um, so I, I knew I wanted to do something, but I wasn't sure exactly what it was that I wanted to do. So that kind of gives you a little bit of my, yeah. my background and my history of my upbringing. So, what are some of the things that you just loved doing growing up that was just, mm. you know, some of the most fun things that just gave you joy to do it? I love that question. No one's ever asked me that. I, and I immediately had a vision of, so I grew up, imagine 16 acres in the country. It's very hilly where I lived. And my dad purchased uh, two three wheelers which are now illegal, but then they were not. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we would ride around on those things. They're so dangerous now, but we would ride around on those things and we would collect mud and we would make mud soup and like <laughs> pretend that we had a restaurant that we owned and <laughs> would pull the onions, the grass, you know, that smells like onions, uh -huh. you know, pull it and, di and chop it up and put it in the mud soup and, pretend that we had a kitchen, <laughs> we, a restaurant that we were, that is a memory that I have that I just, I go back to and I can immediately smell like the country huh. for mm. like the crisp air and the joy of riding on something that was dangerous. <laughs> and I didn't know it was dangerous at the time. <laughs> it sounds like you had dreams of being an entrepreneur. I mean, right? <laughs> you know, opening a restaurant and boy, that sort of seems a bit of a I mean, it seems like one of the other things I read is you also had a love of music that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of is it's one of the strands that led to what you do, at least to a degree. So just talk about where music falls. I mean, I, I, I get you're an entrepreneur, but where does music fall in that kind of mm -hmm. Aaron Eddy, things I love to do kind of mix? Yeah. Well, um, no one should ever trust me to actually cook. So I say, as much as I wanted to, oh, <laughs> so I stuck to mud. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, uh, music came. My grandfather was a musician. He played guitar and sang. And he had his own uh, vinyl record, and he produced hymns. I actually have his vinyl record from when he recorded. And so music definitely came from my grandfather. And I, about 15... I got involved at a church and started singing and then I started doing cover songs and then I started discovering, Oh, like I have a good voice and people like it. They respond to it. They are surprised by it. It's, it's a little bit deeper, soulful voice and I'm four eleven, So people are like, Oh wow. You know, it kind of surprises them what comes out. And, uh, I, and w with my love for poetry and my interest in learning how I can use my vocal cords, I started to just dream a little bit about recording my own music instead of doing other people's songs. I wondered if I um, was capable of recording. And that was after I graduated high school. So I, I started as an art, oh, well, I started doing grunt work at a nonprofit. I begged them for this job. It, while I'm doing that, I'm doing music by night. So I'm recording music, writing songs, coming up with a band. I was newly married. And I, uh, I remember when I decided to go from singing cover songs to singing my original work, I was terrified. And mm -hmm. I think anybody listening that's ever pursued something creatively, I was terrified. I think they'll understand this. I was terrified because it would be my original stuff, which made me more susceptible to people judging me. Mm -hmm. And uh, like if it was somebody else's song, they can judge it and they can listen to it or not. But because it's my own, they can look at it and pick it apart. And they're picking apart parts of my soul. You know, it's my writing. It came out of me. Mm. So um, I learned that I, amidst that, despite that, I loved singing and I loved writing. And so I got a little bit more vulnerable and a little bit more vulnerable recording, playing shows. 
And then uh, just looking at doors that I could walk through that would be willing to put my music on television shows and commercials. And, and that's just kind of how my music career started taking shape. I was newly married. And because of that, I didn't want to go on tour because um, I know tour life would be really hard being newly married. So I'm like, okay, there's another way that I can make this sustainable where I can be at my house. And that was when I started getting into licensing my music. And it seemed like, I mean, you were very successful. You were, um, I guess, had a bunch of music tracks on uh, Tumblr, which, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, at the time was, um, you know, one of the apps of choice for music. And uh, I think you were commercials and did some tracks for Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I mean, you were really uh, doing doing, uh, you know, uh, terrifically. So it mm-hmm. would seem like, gosh, you know, uh, Erin Eddy has this great story. She's an entrepreneur. She was successful, is successful. What a great story, right? Mm-hmm. It sounds yeah. fantastic, <laughs> you know? It's just, oh, you know, it sounds like a, sort of a, a Disneyland it, picture. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, yeah. you know, I, got, I signed with... Um, VH1, MTV, um, uh, Lifetime, Oxygen channel for my music. And that that happened just so organically. I, I just put myself out there and just walked through doors, honestly, that just flew open. And I, I don't want to say I was just was lucky. I think I was just strategic in where I was placing my energy. And I think people will see like a overnight, you know, quote unquote, overnight success I just don't believe it's an overnight thing because I think it started when I started to be vulnerable in my journals at 12, that I finally got to have some music on television and be licensed to commercials and things like that in my mid twenties. But, you know, I learned in my, so I had the, my music blog on Tumblr and put my home address on my Tumblr blog. And I asked people, I said, you know, mail me your personal shirt. I'll spray paint. Uh, an empowering phrase because all my music was empowering. So it just kind of went in with this concept of me creating music and talking to my fans through my blog. And I was like, Hey, mail me, mail me one of your shirts. I'll spray paint that you're so worth loving. and I'll mail it back to you for free. And I was doing that with my, you know, my business is now so worth loving. So I thought I was going to do music like 100%. Um, but that's, that wasn't the case. I, there were, there were bigger plans and so worth loving, uh, spray painting t-shirts for free and reminding people of their worth and their love that they're loved and receiving people's shirts that just came into my mailbox. Um, was so surprised that people needed to be reminded of this message. That's what I realized. This is something so much bigger than music. This is a lifestyle and a way of thinking. And I want to remind people of that. For the rest so, of my life. So let's talk about that phrase, because in the book you write, there were some other things you were trying to, you know, trying to, you know, play with, yeah. uh, like you're beautiful, uh, shine bright. But um, you say that you feel like it's divinely inspired. So talk about what made you center on so worth loving, because, you know, shine bright and you were beautiful. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, you're uh, so, so, I mean, so worth loving is just epically fantastic. I mean, it's just, you know, (laughs) incredible. But but why that phrase versus a number of other positive phrases you could have written on a t-shirt? That's a great question. I I had to get to the root of why I even wanted to empower and encourage other people. So when I started playing with phrases, I was like, well, why do I want to tell people that they're beautiful or that you know, they don't shine too bright or they're not too much. Or one of the reasons why I wanted to remind people in general, something encouraging and empowering was because I was so encouraged and empowered when people believed in my art and wanted to share it. Like it was such a gift to me. I couldn't believe people were sharing my music and it was going viral and it was being picked up. Like what an honor. And so when it came to me wanting to remind somebody else and gift them belief and remind them of something uh, that is true about who they are 
uh, I got down to it that they were just, they're loved and they're not just loved. They're, they're worthy of being loved and they're worthy of making healthy choices for themselves. And the one thing that I learned and, and have continued to learn in my journey is that when we believe that we're worth loving and we're worthy of love, the decisions that we make are different relationships that we go into relationships that we say yes and no to, um, and dating and friendship, um, the boundaries that we put in place with our parents, uh, the careers that we, that we choose or don't choose because we don't believe we're deserving or we do believe that we're worthy. And so I think these words, they were, I can craft all of this like so eloquently now, but then I think the root was that I just wanted to remind people that they're not just worth loving, like they are absolutely so worth loving. And it just came to my mind almost like a, a pressing, a whisper that wasn't of mm. me. And I remember thinking, wow, that has to already exist. Cause that's how powerful it impacted mm. me when I, when I came to my mind and it wasn't cause I was so smart. Like it, I definitely believe it was outside of myself is where these words came from. When I started thinking, why do I want to remind people that they're beautiful? Well, I want to actually remind them that they're love. Well, why do I want to remind them that they're love? Because they're worthy of love. Well, why do I want to remind them that they're worthy of they, So it just was like this uh, progression. And uh, I just remember um, Googling as any entrepreneur does right? going to Google and being like, are all the domains available? <laughs> and where can I, have I seen this on a billboard? And I'm just like, <laughs> is this like in my subconscious, you know, like I thought maybe this is in my subconscious and I've seen it somewhere or I have a shirt that already says this and it, none of it existed. And I thought this, this is so much bigger than me. And this is something that I am to steward and learn how to do that and go and through that and down. And one of the things I love when you and I talked first is you mentioned that there are a number of lifestyle brands out there whose mottos are good, whose slogans are good, but they tend to be rooted in actions people should take. I, for instance, mm -hmm. walking through an airport, bought a hat that says, be good to people, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an action you take. What Where you landed, where you wanted to land, is at a place that is not an action someone takes, but a truth that they accept, yeah. um, which... which as you expressed, it sort of moved you even more than than the poetry of the words. This idea that they don't have to do anything. You are mm -hmm. you are loved because you are loved. That's uh, a, a a critical piece of this. And and I want to ask this question because the series here is called "Burn the Ships," right? We're trying to uh, to, to to spotlight folks who who've been courageous enough for whatever reason to to pivot off of what they had thought they were going to do, and they're. And they went someone else, you know, somewhere else. You pivoted yeah. from music into this brand, so worth loving. I have to believe those things are connected a little bit. If you didn't internalize that you were so worth loving, that probably would yeah. have been a more difficult pivot, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I think for the long longest time, I actually one of the reasons why I wanted to gift this phrase to other people and remind them was because. I can look back and go, I actually really, really struggled with believing that I had value and an offering and that I had a purpose. And uh, it came from some childhood stuff with a relative and like words that were spoken over me. So I think in some ways, as much as I was gifting other people, because I believe that for my friends and for people I, I don't know, I also think that I just just desperately wanted to believe it about myself that I was mm. worthy of love and that I didn't have to perform and I didn't have to look a certain way or be a certain way in order to be loved. And then in, in order to have an offering or value, which is interesting because like when I look back, I'm like my childhood, like with my mom and my dad, as y'all heard earlier, like my dad empowered us. And it, it just goes to show that if we don't pay attention to these little lies, whether it's something that society says over us, whether it's a, a lie that someone spoke over us that sounded so true, and you could almost confirm the lie, which I have found myself doing. I will, I will have confirmed a lie with another lie, but it feels so true. 
I think that I can look back and go, I, I had done that a lot. I had made a lot of agreements with lies that weren't true. And I, I desperately wanted to believe that I was worthy of love. You know, one of the things we talk about all the time and beyond the crucible and I talk about is uh, that some often our purpose comes out of the ashes of your crucible. And this, mm -hmm. you know, you're so passionate about um, So Worth Loving because it feels like for so many years you struggled to believe that about yourself. And even as you were launching it, I think you, I read, it wasn't like you felt like you were quite there yet, but maybe it's aspirational, you're on the journey. And so you wanted other people to feel what you were trying to feel. And I just think of that of the reverse, as you were saying, if you think that you're not worth love, loving, that you're broken, that you're mm -hmm. awful, that you're ugly, that you're unwanted, almost biblically a leper, unclean, then that leads to a lot of bad choices, bad thoughts. It just leads to a very dark mm -hmm. place. And as you say, it's fascinating how you grew up in a, a pretty good upbringing, if you will. And it's just, it's possible to believe lies. And even like little things, I mean, just you start in the book talking about how, you know, being the youngest of three girls and, you know, they like to kind of, I don't know, dress up with the little sister and gee, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting, you know, affirmation by performing. I mean, I don't think anybody meant anything bad by it, but even little things. I don't know whether that was one of the first little lies that cropped in your head. Nobody's fault, but somehow to just talk about where did that happen? It just, yeah. I mean, it just seemed it grew and several, you know, where did that, that thought in your head that I'm not worth loving? You know, if that's, it just felt like that was a theme. And where did that, I mean, where did that start? How did that grow? Because mm. it just, I don't know, it just, it was sad and it was hard to get my head around, to be honest. Mm. You know, just how did that all happen? I remember what you're re referring to in the book where I talk about, I was always a little performer, like my karaoke machine, like I would you know, sing on a karaoke machine and make my whole family come down and watch me. And I would do like Kiss from a Rose by Seal. Like that was like, and Eric Clapton was like my thing. <laughs> <to> <laughs> and my sisters are six and eight years older than me. So there's a pretty big gap and uh, probably tolerance uh, towards a little girl when they want to like, you know, they're in high school and I'm at this younger age. So, <clears throat> and that's just natural. I think what, what I, what lie hooked into me at such a young age was I need to do certain things. I need to perform or believe or think or act certain ways in order for my sisters to want to be around me, um, in order for my sisters to pay attention to me because I longed for, uh, attention from them because I was, our age gap was so big that I, would tell myself that and it would just grow and it would grow quietly. And that's what lies do. They are, there's a seed. And then if we don't address them, that seed just grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And so it went into, you know, I'm 15, 16 and now I need to perform and be a certain thing or, or act a certain way in order to have friends or in order to do this or in order to do that. And, and then what confirms it is if you have a relative that's, emotionally or, or verbally abusive that speaks words over you. It's confirming it. It's like I had this lie when I was seven or eight. And then I had this relative when I'm 15, 16, 17, saying the things in my formative years that it's just, okay, now it's growing bigger. Now this must be true. And then you go into, you know, a, a dating relationship that mirrors and almost models what unhealthy love is. Cause that's, what I knew was, you know, mm. what was normal to me was unhealthy love um, uh, with that relative. It was like emotional and verbal abuse. Uh, they meant well, you know, like they meant well, like they weren't, it was never like it was, it was um, packaged in a way that a young girl would not know is this is bad and dangerous until you go into a relationship. And then that relationship 
is unhealthy. And so you're just all of a sudden you're surrounding yourself with a lot of lies that aren't true. And I, you know, I'm fast forward and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but mm. you know, I, I meet my former husband at 17. I'm married at 21 and uh, I go through a divorce at 29 and I never thought that that would, uh, that would be my story. And a lot of, a lot of our hardship, we never thought we'd go through something and we do. And for me, that was the moment that the divorce, once I started seeking healing, ripped up the lights that were rooted from seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 17, um, that I believed about myself. Um, and I talk about in the book, like, the beauty of a breakdown is that you can rebuild on stronger mm. foundation. And that was the beauty in, in my breakdown of believing a lot of stuff and making choices out. And, you know, what, I love what you shared earlier. It was so worth loving as much as I started it. It wasn't because I had arrived to believe that I was worthy of love, but it was that I wanted to remind other people partially because I wanted to believe it about myself, partially because I didn't, I wasn't as connected to my story. So it was easier for me to, communicate it. Um, and now it's ironically, it's easier and it's harder because I now know what it's like to be on the other. It's like, there's a lamenting and a pain that comes attached mm. to that, that phrase that back then it, there wasn't that <laughs> to the same level of that. It, 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 does that make sense? <laughs> it, it does. I feel like we're all on a journey, but you believe that now mm. you believe Aaron Eddy is so worth loving. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we. Yeah. I think, you know, it's hard as humans, it's hard to be there a hundred percent because we all have doubts and fears and anxieties, but vastly more than, you know, years ago, um, that's, that would be true. Right. That you really do yeah. believe that, you know, it's yeah. not just, it's not just, I'm not making lighter. It's not just a t-shirt. It's something you believe about yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it took me going through destructive, honestly, um, when I, uh, oh, sorry, my speaker, my ear pod died. Hold on a second. And make sure you're recording. Are you all? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, we can um, hear you. Okay. Can it's you hear good. me? Okay. Yeah. I think my speaker just went out. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We can hear you. Can't hear y'all. Yes, oh. indeed. Y'all went away. Okay, now I can't. Okay. Okay, we, we, we can hear. We can kind of edit that bit. But just, well, we, we, we were, go ahead, Gary. I was going to say, we'll fix it in post. So it's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So we, we're talking about uh, just oh. coming to the realization that you are worth loving. Yes. Um, so, you know, after my divorce, I you would think that it's like, okay, I'm now worth loving. You know, this like, and that was not the case for me. I, I actually dove into dating really quickly, destructive choices. Um, just when I say that, when you believe you're worthy of love, the decisions that you make look different. They do. And so they look different if you don't believe it and they look do if you do believe it. And for me, I didn't believe it. And so I ran away from myself. I didn't want to be with just myself. I wanted to be with other people. I didn't know what it was like to be independent and um, love and value just me. I mean, I met my former husband when I was 17 and I was married by 21. So singleness was really uncomfortable for me. And in addition, I had a lot of baggage of lies that I believed about myself and then stuff that came within the marriage of being on the other side of another person. And and their lack of believing that they are loved and the decisions that they chose because of that lack of love. And so, you know, it wasn't until I got exhausted of my own choices and not believing. I, I remember there was a night I was burned out. I was burned out on work, friendship, dating, life. I just honestly didn't even want, um, I didn't want to exist. I didn't want to hurt myself, but I didn't want to exist because everything around me just felt like it was crushing and I could not imagine it, anything getting better anytime soon. And I remember 
um, taking a bath and ha- like sinking into the tub where my face is just showing. If any women are listening, I don't know how many men take baths like this, but they just. <laughs> <laughs> I I just sunk into the tub and I just, my thoughts were so loud and I just, just sat there and I was just like, gosh, I just, I want everything to be different. Like, how do I get out of this? How do I change my life? And changing my life was believing that I'm valued and that I'm loved and that I have purpose. And when I believe that I actually can serve and be selfless and be active in community and, and show up like, and just show up in hard spaces. Um, for so long I had battled with so worth loving people believing that self love is selfish. And so it's the actual complete opposite. It's (laughs) when you, when you know you're valued and you know that you're loved, you do show up differently in your friends' lives and in your community and in your family with compassion and grace. And uh, you're not, you're not flinched by somebody going through something. You can be there for them because you've been there for you. And that's, that moment was the awakening for me of, of it. And my life did not get better. Once I decided to believe I was worthy of love, I had to go through a lot lot of stuff in order. Therapy was one of them uh, (laughs) to, to believe it, but yeah, that's kind of how so Worth loving became awakened within me and me believing it. So, what was the key to that? Because I get it, you had these negative um, self-talk, uh, performance. You know, it sounds like some challenging things with your first husband, and then I think you write in the book there was I don't know a year or so after uh, the divorce there was a relationship where you know the guy says you know I can't get there or something, and then. Rejection after rejection, uh, it's like, you know, how much do they want to pile on me? It's like, come on. I mean, you know, it's just mountains. I mean, what was the key, the anchor that started you believing that you were worth loving? What was Mm -hmm. that key for you? Well, the relationship when I, the first chapter I talk about how it was my first serious relationship out of my divorce. And I was with my former husband for about 13 years. So it was, it was this relationship. There was a like, all, basically when it became, when it came to an ending on my baggage, I talk about comes forward. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. um, I remember not, I, I wanted to be with him so badly wanted to be with this relationship that ended when he told me, I just can't get there, Aaron. I just remember thinking like, where is there? Like, where is there? Does that mean you can't get to loving me? Like what is mm-hmm. And so I was crushed by those words. I can't get there. Um, and I remember after that, after that, I can't get there. I can't, I I wanted to be with him, but I couldn't Mm -hmm. because he didn't, he didn't want to be with me. I didn't want to date anybody else. So I'm stuck with me, you know, and I didn't want to be with me. Like I wanted Mm -hmm. to be with him. And and that was when, that was the moment where it was like, oh, this is Aaron. Why don't you want to be with you? Like, what is wrong with you? Like, what is, mm-hmm. not like what is wrong with you, but also maybe, mm-hmm. but, <laughs> sure. but like, yeah. what, what, what do you think is so wrong with you that you can't just mm-hmm. enjoy you? And so I, I decided I committed to taking a, a break, like a year off dating and date myself and, uh, and get to know myself and, and treat myself with kindness. And that looked like, um, not drinking a bottle of wine by myself. It looked like crawling out of bed to brush my teeth, which was a big feat for me because I fell into this state of depression. And the depression really was this, I remember my therapist telling me it was suppressed anger. I was so angry and I had been performing my way through anger and ignoring and denying it. I I suppressed all this. And the anger was, I'm mad at him for doing this. I'm mad at them for saying this. I'm mad at me for doing this. I'm mad at, you know, it was like, I was so angry, but um, I'm I'm a very optimistic, naturally glass full, not Mm -hmm, empty mm -hmm. uh, type of personality. And so it was hard for me to get to my anger and access it. And so once I, once I gave myself permission to get angry, that to me communicated to me that my feelings mattered. 
So whoever told me that my feelings didn't, I'm telling myself that they do. And that was, that was on my path to discovering and, and recognizing that I am worthy of love and I'm worthy uh, to get to know. And it, and I can do that with just me. And, you know, part of it, part of my story is there's a faith component. I remember crying out to God in that moment in the bathtub with the water kind of <laughs> covering my face, just, just crying out and being like, God, like, if you are who you say you are, where were you in all of this stuff that happened? Where were you when they did this? Where were you when she said that? Where were you when, like, where were you? And it, that permission to be angry at other people and the permission to be angry at God, because I was really angry at God, was the beginning of me to learning that I am worthy of love. And that I have value and I, and my feelings and who I am are worth getting to know because God didn't flinch when I did that. (laughs) And maybe the realization that God really does love you. Yeah. Well, and and, it was, and believing that. Absolutely. It was his response to me was when I realized I can show up and I can be my fullest self. And, and that looks like a mess with a lot of baggage and a lot of anger. And he shows me by his response for um, bringing certain, I get emotional talking about it because it's so tender. Every time I talk about this part of my story, no matter how many interviews I've done on it, <laughs> I cry. Um, it's all good. But he, he truly, he surrounded me with people uh, that believed that I was worthy of love and mirrored back to me what I I had struggled to believe. And, uh, he also just did some miraculous little things that are between me and him that you, you can't unsee and you cannot unbelieve. And around the same, go ahead. And around the same time, you're sending out these t-shirts and you're getting letters from people. And Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, I mean, what was in those letters Mm -hmm. and what did those letters speak to you about how you were on the right path? You had taken a torch to your singing career in the sense of that wasn't your primary, you know, a pursuit. So Worth Loving was your your primary pursuit. You send out these t-shirts. You're at this place where you you believe that you yourself are so worth loving. Now you're getting feedback from the people you're helping, from the community you've just begun to build. What was that like? What did you hear back from them and how did that help you on your journey? Yeah. I love that question because the so worth loving community is so brave because the so worth loving community is so vulnerable. And I think it's just in order to be vulnerable, you are brave. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> so I would receive letters of people telling me why they felt unworthy of love, whether it was that their father never hugged them all growing up in their childhood. And they just affection, physical affection. They felt like they were undeserving of somebody just giving a, an embrace, a hold, a hug uh, to stories of people telling me, I remember one of the women on our team, she served on our team for about nine years. And uh, her story is absolutely beautiful. And she was one of the first letters I've ever received. And she was sexually abused at 11. She was raped Mm. um, at 12. She had an abortion from her rape. And she had overcome an eating disorder, suicidal ideation and self-harm. And she has uh, just a resiliency. Mm. And I think that's what I... I saw in a letter, whether it was my dad never hugged me or there, whatever it may be, whether it was, you know, quote unquote, severe or not severe to that person, it's not for us to decide what is severe and what's not. Um, And that's one thing that I saw because regardless, it's crushing and your circumstance does hurt and it aches and it tells you something about yourself, whether there's a truth that comes to it or a lie that comes to it. Uh, But what I learned was that there's this resiliency that takes place in any story that we've ever received. And it's the resiliency. What looks what's within resiliency is questions 
And the question is, am I worthy of love? And then it's trying to understand why you are. And I think that is so brave. And that's what Sword Loving gifted me because I saw all these stories of people questioning, asking questions and processing something that hurt them and harmed them. Uh, they're what, whether it was a lie, like I said earlier, they, they're looking at, they're looking at it in the face. And so for me in my moment of just burnout and breakdown and not wanting to exist anymore, I can reflect back and go, our community would look at it in the face and be scared Mm -hmm. doing it and then address it and ask questions and go on the journey of healing and uh, that's what So Worth Loving Community modeled for me. They they taught me, our community, which is everybody, because everybody's worthy of love, <laughs> um, that we're not this exclusive crew. It's just who what has evolved over the last decade. Um, they taught me to look at it and be curious and ask questions with safe people. And that's why I say, like, I've seen people have conversations Uh, with safe individuals and groups. And I've seen lives transformed because of it. And that transformed my life with that being modeled for me. And what does it feel like when people say, you know, Aaron, as I'm sure they do, you've changed my life. Mm -hmm. You've helped me. You've given me a drop of grace when I didn't believe it. I didn't believe I was worth loving. I believed I was, shouldn't exist but I believe maybe I do, maybe I am worth loving. What does it do to you when people say, you know, you've changed my life, as I'm sure people have said that to you? I have heard those words and I have had a hard time receiving them uh, due to the fact that I don't believe that I invented worth or value or love. (laughs) And so uh, there's there's a piece of me that struggles with embracing that. And But in the same lane, I also am very honored that my messiness and my baggage is being redeemed by me being vulnerable and sharing my struggles and my failures and seeing a life being changed out of what I thought was going to ruin me and what I thought I couldn't ever come out of. So there's this like, when somebody says my story has changed them, I, my response is always all of our stories change each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I just get have an opportunity to be vocal about it in the space that I'm being placed in. Um, but I think that's, that's what's so beautiful about each of our stories is I think there's a stewardship to it because we all struggle with believing something that, uh, can be a slow drip to our to seeing our value and our worth, and uh, we don't, you know, we don't drift into a healthy direction. I really believe that we don't just drift <laughs> to it. <laughs> it's a, an accumulation of things that we believe are about ourselves is the where how we go into a space of health, and so. Um, so I'm going to jump in. Just, I'm going to yeah, jump in. Continue Warwick. on that because that's a whole other. <laughs> so good. So good. I'm going to jump in, Warwick, before you say what you're going to say because I sure. saw you with that look of recognition <laughs> on your face, and and Fine, I man. would not be serving the listeners to this podcast well as well as I want to if I didn't point out what to me is breathtakingly obvious: the stories that you're telling, Aaron. And the, and the stories that Warwick has shared on this show over close to 150 episodes are, are incredibly similar. I'm reading from your webpage. We exist to remind you that no matter your history, past mistakes, career choice, relationship status, or the history you've come from, you are worthy of love. That could be, with a slight modification at the end, none of that defines you. That could be on the, the Beyond the Crucible website. The, the words that you use to describe your experiences are, are remarkably similar and your stories are remarkably dissimilar. That's the beauty of this forum. That's the beauty of recognizing that your worst moment doesn't define you. Your worst feelings about yourself don't define you. Some things just are. And uh, it, 
so worth loving is one thing that just is, just as being able to move beyond your crucible just is if you learn the lessons and you apply it. So I'm done pontificating on behalf of the listener, <laughs> and I turn it back over to you, Warwick, the host. No, well, well said, Gary. Extremely well said. I've obviously, you know, uh, been thinking that the whole time I read the book and the whole time we've been talking, but obviously I want to, you to share your story and let me just uh, uh, go on. But yeah, I mean, I can relate to so much of what you're saying. I mean, to me, part of my journey has been a journey of self-acceptance, a journey that I'm okay. Just, I know somebody wrote a song a long time ago, I think uh, maybe it was a Christian song called Broken and, and Beautiful, something like that. And then that theme has obviously come up elsewhere and I love that uh, phrase because for me, as again, listeners would know, growing up in a large family media business, um, heir apparent, you know, my notion was my desires are irrelevant. It's all about duty and living up to my parents, especially my father's dreams and working hard at school, getting good grades, Oxford. Wall Street, Harvard Business School, I mean, all about, none of it was about my own desires. It was all about fulfilling what I thought was a sacred duty. I mean, not to go on too much, but the company was founded by a believer, as strong a businessman for Christ as I've ever come across. Now, the faith became more traditional with the generations, but so then when it all ended and after my $2 million takeover failed and my wife's American, we moved to America in the early 90s. Yeah, there was this sense of how could I have been so dumb and incredible self-recrimination and uh, how could I have caused this much damage? And so for me, it was coming to a sense of self-acceptance. It's okay to be me. Yes, I've made some mistakes. Um, I have my quirks. When when th when things like that happen, it does have consequences. There's damage. You know, I'm pretty functional. I've had my own share of counseling, but yeah, just... You know, part of the journey that we all go through is just being comfortable in our own skins, being comfortable with who we are. Obviously, for you, you write about this being comfortable being, you know, a slight build and 411, you know, and <laughs> you probably are now, but there was a time in which, why couldn't I have been a tad taller, 5'3, 5'4, 5'2, something, you know? Uh, so I get it. I mean, for me, without boring with it all, you know, I'm not. I'm athletic, but I've never really been an athlete. It's funny when I when we first got married, my wife is a, a you know it was one of six, so she has four brothers and a sister, and they're all over six feet. And they're athletes, and it's like that was not me, you know. <laughs> so fortunately, my wife Gail, you know, that wasn't high on her list to you know marry some six foot plus athlete. Fortunately. <laughs> but, you know, I'm somebody that um, I don't like competition. A lot of guys just like razzing each other and, you know, having a bet on, you know, a dollar a hole in golf. I hate that. Mm -hmm. So there's things about me I feel like, well, I don't know any guy that's like me that that hates competition. Maybe there are, we don't need to psychoanalyze it. I'm sure there are reasons. But it's like, I'm now like over 60. It's like, you know, that's okay. I am areas where I'm broken. There are things I hate doing, like I don't like competition. I don't like that whole sort of thing. That's okay. I can live with that. I don't. Ha I'm not going to go into intense therapy to try and heal my anti-competitiveness. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You know, I've accepted it. There was a time when I just felt terrible about myself over things like that, over lies. Mm -hmm. So anyway, enough about me. But I guess part of the journey for all of us is just self-acceptance that I am worth loving, that I am okay. I mean, I'm blessed to be married to, you know, a girl, uh, you know, I met a lot of years ago. We married over 30 years and I accept her, she accepts me. And I mean, that's just an indescribable gift that, mm -hmm. you know, every day, and obviously it's where I tear up, there's not one day that I don't say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Not one day, <laughs> um, you know, again, too much talking. My dad was married three times, my mother twice, so I don't take that for granted. So anyway, mm -hmm. all that's to say is there's this notion of being broken but beautiful. Yes, we have our quirks, we have our issues, but yet God still loves us. We are worth loving despite about despite our brokenness. Does that make sense? And forgive yeah. the long-winded explanation, yeah. but does that make sense, Aaron? Absolutely. That's so beautiful. That's so beautifully said.
and self-acceptance. You're right. It's like, if we can just go, you know, this is, this is just how I am. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I am as hard as I will work to be structured. I'm just not wired that way, you know? And, and, uh, (laughs) My sweet man is very structured and I'm grateful that he just accepts the fact that I am a little bit messy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but you're right. Self-acceptance, when you shared just like being with somebody that can accept you for who you are, they model what you want to do for yourself. And it's to accept who you are and, and to not have to explain it. You know, you're right. Like, I mean, I stopped growing in fifth grade, you know, and that's probably when I repeated fifth grade too. So a lot happened in fifth grade. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Lots of things uh, happened in in me desiring to be taller or look a certain way or be wired mentally a certain way. That if we can all just go, you know what, whatever society says is like the best of the best is not true we can have more freedom to embrace who we are. We're at a point in the show where I normally say the captain's turned on the fasten seatbelt sign, which indicates it's about time to land the plane, but we're not quite there yet. Because the title of the series is Burn the Ships, I've got to think of a better metaphor uh, of involving captains of ships. I don't know what they do when it's time to dock, but I'll, re- I'll research that for the next time. Here's one thing that I want to say. Uh, Two things I want to say before I then hand it back over to Warwick. One uh, is is this, Aaron. Um, uh, I've hosted, co-hosted with Warwick about 145, 148 of these, and and I'm going to end saying something to you, um, and I'm going to do it without looking at my notes. I want to look right in your face and tell you this: um, when you burned your ships. You lit the seas for others. And that is a beautiful, beautiful, important, resonant thing. Let Please absorb that because that's come through loud and clear in this conversation. Thank you so much, Gary. I received that. I'm going to have you email that to me too so I can write that down because that was beautiful. I, I will do that. The other thing that I have to end on here before I get off stage, as it were, is I would be absolutely remiss if I did not give our listeners um, the opportunity to hear from you how they can how they can find out more about So Worth Loving. So where can they find you in the the World Wide Web? How can they get a hold of you and and find yeah. out more about So Worth Loving? They can go to SoWorthLoving.com. Uh, if you we're, and then we're all on, on social media. It's all so worth loving. And then uh, I'm a co-host to a podcast called God Hears Her, where we talk about um, conversations and questions on if God actually hears us. And that's been a, a real joy of mine as well. You can find us there too. You're me. Find me there. Excellent. <laughs> you also well, find I'm- me, Aaron Eddy, E-R-Y-N-E-D-D-Y, um, on Instagram, Facebook, all those places. Awesome. Well, as a... Bravo for co-hosts of podcasts. Bravo for us because uh, <laughs> I finally met another co-host. That's excellent. Uh, Warwick, <laughs> as the host, it's your prerogative to, to, to take us home, to land the plane. So take it away. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. I mean, this is really inspiring. Your book was inspiring. I could relate to uh, so much of it. Um, you know, the, certainly in my own life, I imagine in yours, there are words like uh, redemption, um, you know, healing, um, I don't know, acceptance. There's all sorts of uh, all sorts of words. I mean, we all have, even as we're doing well, there are still days in which maybe we fall off the wagon, if you will, or, you know, a bad thought comes in, a lie, and... We now have tools to deal with it, so we bounce back a little quicker, hopefully. But um, yeah, I mean, I feel like your story is one of uh, redemption, is, you know, calling lies what they are, lies, being able to use your brokenness, your wounds to help others. And Mm -hmm. that, to me, is where 
it's really a purpose of God, purpose-filled journey. I remember early on in my uh, walk back in the early 90s, a friend gave me this, it was a faith-based book. I think it was, somehow I remember the, ty- the author, R.T. Kendall. It was about the story of Joseph. And mm. there's that famous line at the end of, and it's like Genesis 50, somewhere around there, in which it says, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And obviously, some would know the backstory is, Joseph's brothers uh, threw him in a, literally in a pit, and then he was sold into slavery and went to Egypt and ended up being uh, the Pharaoh's right-hand man, prime minister, if you will. Yeah. But, you know, God had a purpose with that pain, and I think God had a purpose in the pain I went through, and clearly, from my faith perspective, God had a purpose in the pain that you've gone through. Yeah. You think how many women, how many people wouldn't have been helped if you hadn't gone through. So if you say, well, why did I have to go through all this? Well, maybe we'll, you know, we see through a glass dimly, maybe you'll get a fuller answer one day. I think, I think you will. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, look at all the people that you've helped. And that was my purpose and uh, the sense that, you, you know, just how much healing and uh, hope. And that's, you know, part of why I do what I do and you do what you do is I share what I've been through, not to sort of wallow in, uh, gloom and darkness, but just to try and give people hope. And so people are going to be listening to this and say, you know, if if Erin can come back from what she's been through, maybe there is hope. Maybe mm-hmm. I am worth loving. So uh, mm-hmm. as we sometimes often do, just there may be people listening, women, men, who may feel like today's their worst day. They may, they may, they may feel like Nobody loves me. I'm not worth loving. I will never be worth loving. I'm broken. I'm awful. Uh, I shouldn't exist. What word of hope would you give to that person? Maybe today's their worst day. Maybe they think there's no way I could ever be worth loving. What word of hope would you give that person? That's a great question. To the to the person that's listening right now that is in a, is in that headspace of just feeling like they don't want to exist. Um, maybe feeling completely weighted down by the choices that they've made or words that somebody said over them or a circumstance that they're currently in. I, I do want to remind that person that Um, this moment right now is temporary. Um, It's not your forever. And there are safe people around you that want to help carry the weight. And you can't do it alone and you aren't alone. Um, And I I just want to remind that person that, you know, Celebrate the little victories and don't be critical or hard on yourself. If you can't, what feels like would be a big step and you can't do the big step, don't worry about the big step, do the small steps because the small steps will be an accumulation of a big step. Um, And so that could look like, it's hard to get out of bed, make a goal to get out of bed and brush your teeth and let that be the victory today. Wherever you are right now and whatever you choose right now is enough Um, and keep making small steps and find the safe people to share so that they can help carry uh, the weight. And I would just remind them too that they are absolutely worthy of love. They are valued um, and they they have a place here in this world and they... We, w- we want you to take up space because you are worthy to do that just as you are right now in your mess. I have been in the communications business long enough, way longer than <laughs> enough to know when the last word on the subject has been spoken. And Aaron Eddy, you've just spoken it. Uh, mm-hmm. Listener, until the next time we're together, remember, we are in the midst of a series that we're calling Burn the Ships. And uh, there's a central truth that came out of this conversation with Aaron that will come out of the conversations we have subsequent to this. And that's this. If your ship 
If your ships are not sailing in the, in the direction you wish they were sailing, if you feel like you are drifting off course, light a match. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week. Thank you.